Good Wednesday evening to you guys. I hope you're having a great week so far. It's been a, a been a good week. I'm thankful for that. Uh, thankful for uh, the Sunday services we had. I hope you're tuning in, and we're going to talk about that here in a moment. But hopefully, you're tuning in to our services. We had uh, this last Sunday was the anniversary, 52nd wedding anniversary of Dave and Donna, and so happy anniversary to them. And thankful for uh, for Dave and Donna. They're they're such a fun couple. And we love them and thankful for their uh, generosity and love for our church. And uh, we, we sure do miss seeing them, that's for sure. But uh, all that to say, too, is that uh, we, I, I pray that you've been attending services online and that you're, you're taking the opportunities to, uh, to go to the services and stay on schedule. Now, also, this last week, Brother Clint Minnick, if you remember, he had a, we prayed about the fact that he had an appointment to go to on Monday and then surgery on Thursday. Well, all in all, he actually, 30 minutes before his appointment on Monday morning uh, in Loma Linda, the doctors called and told him that they were gonna do surgery that day. So anyway, um, uh, Pastor Clint Minnick got uh, into surgery and then um, they what they did was they got the porcelain out of his eye, praise the Lord, isn't that great? They got the porcelain out of his eye and uh, he's, he literally now knows what it means to have a beam in one's eye. So now he can judge us all and uh, because he's, he's got that porcelain in his eye. So anyway, but um, or now it's out. But he also, they, they repaired the retina. So they got two out of the three things done, which is a huge blessing. And so he's doing really good. Um, his wife texted us and let us know that automatically that he was ready to eat a four by four from in and out I'll tell you what, you don't have to take me to surgery to be ready to eat a four by four from in and out. Anyway, but uh, thankful for the procedure going well for him. He still um, had a follow-up appointment coming up and then also a um, another surgery to take care of the cataract that built up in his eye because of this. So let's continue to pray for him. What we're praying for is full eyesight restoration. Would you pray with me on that, uh, church family? Uh, we're going to spend some time praying here tonight as well. And then um, the other thing I'm going to ask you to do is that we're really praying about our missionaries and uh, taking care of our missionaries. We praise the Lord for the opportunity that afforded to us in missions. I want you to diligently pray uh, because we need to do this by faith. I, I think it'd be good for us to, um, uh, to pray about adding to our missions family. Wouldn't that be just such a blessing to get out of this COVID-19 um, situation is that through it, we were able to see our missions giving go up and also the ability to see missions uh, given to more missionaries or just giving more to our current missionaries. So there's some wisdom to all this and we want to pray about it. Already in my mind, I'm thinking about um, the fact that we have the, um, uh, the Padillas in Germany that we could uh, possibly add to our missions family. I was thinking about um, down in uh, Uruguay, uh, the princes, and then also in Nauru, the McGeorges. Uh, we just had them in not too long ago. Just think about different uh, folks that we can add to our missions family. I know uh, their names are escaping me right now. I should have wrote them down, but just folks that we could pray about to add to our mission. So I want you to pray with me about that. I'm going to pray about that tonight, uh, but pray. And we just want to ask the Lord. We also want to obey the Lord through. We want to move by faith and just add to our missions family. So. Um, let me know. Send me a text message. Uh, give me a call. Let me know what your thoughts are on that, if you would. I, I uh, highly uh, uh, recommend that. I need to hear from you in that. But, of course, uh, it's, it's the church's heartbeat taking on uh, our missionaries to actually, if we pay them more or if we just add to our missions family. So, anyway, or we can do both. Who knows? By faith, that's how we're going to move as a church, amen? Or we're going to move by fear, and we're going to be afraid to do things the rest of our lives. We're not doing that. I'll tell you that much. So let's move by faith, church family. And then um, and then as we pray for the Minnicks and then pray for our mission family, I also want to pray for our church family tonight and ask you to just be in prayer for yourselves and pray for others and minister to others. Are you checking in with each other? Are you checking in to see how everyone's doing? Uh, are you are you concerned about others? Have we gotten a little complacent in our schedule? I know that we have our services. It takes a lot of work, and I, I'm not trying to um, pat ourselves on the back or anything, but I, I just want you to know a little bit about the effort that it takes into uh, doing these services. You know, um, we're, I'm thankful to preach the word, but I'll tell you what, we, uh, you know, we're preaching the word and we're preaching to a camera, and, um, and thank the Lord for that because it's not just a camera, 
Um, we have a, a great camera. We have great lighting. We have a place to do this. So we praise the Lord for that. Then it's all going into the internet and going on to Facebook Live or to YouTube. And we set those times at a specific time. So much so that someone, Brother Andrew specifically, has to be there ready to upload the service at the specific time on Facebook Live. And then it's already scheduled to load up on YouTube. So it takes a lot of extra work. And sometimes if you're maybe... You know, it's 9.45 and you're just kind of rolling out of bed and you're just a little tired and you didn't want to attend the service at 10. Certainly you can um, get to the services later and watch them later. But can I be honest with you? You need to keep a schedule on Sundays. You need, especially Sundays, but throughout the week. And uh, it's not time. It's the Lord's Day. I want to encourage you and just, just really admonish and edify you through this that you, you stay on schedule. Don't get off schedule. There's a lot of work that goes into this, and more than importantly than just the work, it's the fact that God wants to speak to you, and uh, just listening to it. It's amazing to me. I wonder, before the excuse was, you know, even attending services, if you had a hard time attending services, now we have church service in our homes, and we're still making excuses of why we can't watch the services, or why we're running late to them. Because once we get back together, I want to encourage you not to be late to services, but to be early to services. Be there 15 minutes early. And so we're going to start practicing um, social interaction again instead of social distancing, okay? And, uh, but we, we want you to, I want you to do that, church family, and, and uh, just set a schedule and be there. Be faithful to it. Now, I can't govern that, and I can't knock on your door to make sure that you're there at that certain time. But I'm telling you... If you're hungry, you'll get up and go to the fridge. You know, you'll get up and go to the pantry and get something to eat. You know, blessed are they that, that thirst and hunger after righteousness. You know, if, if you're hungry for the Word of God and you, you want the Word of God in your life, hey, you'll get up and get to that set time when it's necessary for you. And I want to encourage you to do that, would you? And, uh, I, you know, I listen. As your pastor, I listen to other messages. Uh, even throughout the week, I listen, to, I listen to preaching, but I listen to other messages on Sunday. Uh, as well, I, I try to tune into ours, but I've preached the message, and I there's times where I will. And you ask my wife and my kids, I'll sit there and I'll listen to the whole sermon all over again. Uh, but man, I'll tell you what, uh, for me, um, I, I like to hear preaching and get preached at. Now, the, 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 the saving grace is that when I'm listening to me preach, I'm hearing my voice, but I know there's truth being preached uh, from the Word of God. So. You know, I just want to encourage you to just, I have to be there. And I set times when I'm listening to it, and you should too, and uh, church family. So I just want to encourage you with that. Don't get complacent about that. In the midst of all this, we're starting to get a little bit maybe uh, complacent. Let's not be complacent. Let's be diligent uh, with what's going on. And let's be content where we are right now, but let's not be complacent with it, okay? So I want to pray tonight for Pastor Minnick. I want to pray tonight for our missions as well. And then I want to pray for us, okay? And then we'll get into the message here tonight. Let's spell for prayer. God in heaven, we come before you. We thank you so much for the time to pray. And we thank you that it's still, you're, you've called your house a house of prayer. So I, I, that you desire for it to be a house of prayer. So I pray, God, as we come before you, that even right now that our church family just bows their head and, and would pray together uh, in spirit with me, even though this is recorded earlier, I'm just thankful for the opportunity that, that prayer uh, knows no time and knows no boundary that way. It's just going to you. So uh, lift up this this prayer tonight, dear God, um, regarding Pastor Minnick and intercessory for him and, and for Miss Maureen and for the kids. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bless them. I think about um, uh, how you bless them with the opportunity to get that surgery done on Monday. And as I was talking to him on the phone, I appreciate his friendship and brotherhood that we have, that he calls me up while he's in the waiting room and and um, and he he just lets me know uh, where his heart is and how he's thrilled with the fact that he doesn't have to wait and it could be done then and how God uh, you just open up those doors so thank you God for that and I praise you for His Spirit I pray that you continue to be with His eyesight help to see full recovery Lord out of that eye that'd be such a blessing God I pray uh, just have to wear that patch a little bit longer and then be able to take it off so that he can see thank you for him coming through the surgeries healthy Lord I thank you for the fact that you kept him healthy through the procedures, especially with the uh, coronavirus stuff that's been going on and being in the hospitals there. And I know he's had to take a couple of those tests already, and uh, that's not exactly a fun thing to go through, but I thank you for the health that you've given him. Thank you for the health you've given Miss Maureen and the kids. I pray that you continue to be with uh, uh, Brindley and uh, Ashlyn, excuse me, and 
with Preston and Brindley and Lacey and Carson. God, I pray that you would just bless them and uh, continue to give them health and strength. Be with Miss Maureen as she holds the fort down for, uh, while she's uh, yeah, doing a lot of work, God, and uh, also as uh, Pastor Minnick continues to pastor Freedom Baptist, and I pray for Freedom Baptist. You bless 29 Palms, the church there. Thank you for the opportunity to support them financially. Now, I also come before you, Lord, with that in mind. We're thankful for mission support. We thank you for the opportunity to support missionaries and the six that we support. Uh, Lord, we pray that if it be your will that you want us to add uh, to our missions family, that you just give us wisdom and discernment for that. And then also, to, actually, Lord, just give us boldness and faith to, to move forward, dear God, if you're speaking our hearts and help us to be of one mind. That's, that's, a, that's what I'm praying for. I know my heart is that we add to our church family. But God, that we are of one mind as a church is what my desire is. So I pray that, um, Lord, that we see the responsibility to add to our missions family and, and do so. Then, God, I also pray that, um, Lord, if it's your will, that we add to the amount that we give to our missionaries each month. And, and Lord, I pray that you would just um, thank you. We, we want to bless the faithfulness of our missionaries, Lord. We've had missionaries on the field. Uh, for many years now, and we thank the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord, that we've had missionaries that are fairly um, young on the field, but uh, we have some that have been on the field for over 10 plus years, and Lord, that's a lot of work, and, uh, and I pray that throughout that time, sometimes folks get a little discouraged in giving to their missions, and, and not just our church, but other churches. So I pray, God, you'd help us to be diligent with that. And Lord, thank you for our missionaries, and just give us wisdom, Lord, in that. Then I pray for our church family tonight, God, to help us not to be complacent where we are in our spiritual walk. And I pray that you'd help our church family to be disciplined, to, to be at the services at 6 o'clock and then at 10 uh, on Wednesday night, and then at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, and at 5 o'clock on Sunday evening. And Lord, help us just to, to make sure that we're setting those times aside, and that we're not taking them lightly, God, but we're listening to the Word of God and being changed and challenged by it. And then help us just to be present, the fact that we're not present sometimes. Lord, there's all types of excuses of why we don't get attend church when we physically attend church. But it's amazing to me that even when we have the opportunity to have church right at our fingertips and right on our TV screens and, and, and uh, phones and computers, that we're still making excuses of why we're not attending. And Lord, I just think about that, that it's, it, it's obvious that it's not a physical situation, it's spiritual. And Lord, it's a matter of the heart. So I pray that you just help our hearts to be to be mended and to be right with you, God, and help us to have a, a spiritual mind. So, Lord, I do pray for that, and I pray that we be spiritually minded, not carnally minded. Lord, we thank you for this time to preach tonight. Pray that you get all the glory and the honor. I love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Samuel tonight, Second Samuel chapter 12 in your Bibles, Second Samuel chapter 12, and I'm going to preach a message that, uh, or excuse me, Second Samuel chapter 11. Uh, preach a message to you tonight uh, regarding uh, displeasing the Lord. When we displease the Lord. And uh, I want to show you this out of the life of David, a good example for us, a cautionary tale for us, but also a reminder that some of us, uh, we such were some of you, we've been at these situations here in our life uh, before, not necessarily to David's extent, but to the point that we displease the Lord. And so what's it mean when we displease the Lord? And what can we do to avoid that, displeasing the Lord, to, uh, avoiding displeasing the Lord? And then what can we do to restore ourselves right back to the Lord? So we want to see that here tonight out of the Word of God. So 2 Samuel, if you would please, in your Bibles, chapter 11, 2 Samuel chapter 11. I, I know I said uh, chapter 12, but chapter 11, if you would please. All right, this is the life uh, of David. David is the king of Israel. And I, I want you to see what goes on here at this point, okay? So the Bible says in, let's start in verse 1. We're going to read a little bit and scan through, so bear with me, all right? And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? 
So we've heard this story of David and Bathsheba before. Now don't, don't tune me out here. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived. So life was sprung into her through this, through this interaction, this adultery, if you will, with David. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab, you remember Joab was um, uh, his, one of his mighty men, but Joab was also the leader of the armies of David. And Joab sent Uriah, who Uriah was a mighty man of David, uh, back to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. So he's making small talk with him. Kind of interesting. He's not getting to the point. You think maybe he's going to do the noble thing. Something that we don't think about when we know this story is that you think David's calling Uriah to let him know, hey, look, it, I was wrong. I did this. Um, I, I sinned against you. I sinned against God. I sinned against Israel. Um, and I need to make this right. But what he ends up doing is he's asking Uriah a couple of probing questions. How's it going? Uh, a small talk, if you will. And then he gets to verse 8 and says, And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. So now he's kind of buy him off. He's sending him home. What soldier wouldn't want to go home to see his wife, all right? And a, a, a husband on his way home to go see his wife, hadn't seen her, maybe been at war for quite some time. Obviously, the year expired. They had been at war for a little bit. They had besieged, and Uriah had not seen home. So here, to come see his beautiful wife, and, uh, and the Bible tells us that Bathsheba was, uh, was beautiful, and, um, and very beautiful to look upon, the Bible even tells us. And so, no doubt, Uriah, sir, it's the husband. He'd want to see his beautiful wife. But not only that, do what married couples do. And Uriah to see his wife, Bathsheba. And so the king sent some meat down the way, too. Just to have a, have a time. The Bible tells us, uh, again, let, let's not, are we adults here tonight? The whole point, what David was trying to do is get Uriah to sleep with his wife, Bathsheba, so that he could say, oh, she conceived this child, but, and just kind of cover it up. So he's doing his best at that situation, but obviously his best is, is our best is usually our, is, is the worst, okay? But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and went not down to his house. And when they had told David saying, Uriah went not down into his house. So now David's made other people know about this. Because obviously he has servants that know that Bathsheba was there with David. There's a whole lot of moving parts to this. Went not down into his house. David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down into thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. This is how noble and mighty that Uriah is and, and his integrity. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. And David made him drunk. Look at how wicked they, I mean, there's so many moving parts to this, again, that, that David is trying to get Uriah into this inebriated state so that he would just go and sleep with his own wife. And so he, the king himself, you imagine this, talk about conspiracy, talk about cover-ups and everything else like that. What a scandal here that David's a part of, that he's orchestrating all this. He gets Uriah drunk. The king gets him drunk. And at even he went out to lie in his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he still, he went not down to his house to where Bathsheba was. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab. So David, David can't get Uriah to do this, and Uriah was heading back to battle. And he sent a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah, and he wrote it in the letter saying, Set you Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, or retreat from him. Okay? that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. So now Joab's got to take one of his mighty men out of order from the king, okay? 
And Uriah carried this letter back to Joab. Essentially, we've all heard about it, his death sentence, back to Joab. So that whenever the battle would get hot or whenever he get to a place in the specific area, the hottest battle, and where valiant men were, that Joab and the men would pull back and Uriah would be left for himself to a slaughter. David sent not only trying to get cover this up, now, now he's going to continue to sin and he's going to murder Uriah. Wow. What a, what a grievous story, isn't that? I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, throughout history, literature, literature does not compare to the, the astounding truth of the Word of God that gives us the real history and real story of wicked men and then men who were really had, a, a, was a man after God's own heart, but yet you could see even at his best, even at his best, he was just a man. And a sinful man. It's a reminder that we do need the Lord, don't we? It's a reminder that we need him and, and that we need to have the Lord first place in our life. Well, it goes on in the rest of the story, which we'll jump to, but I just want to read verse 27. So jump to verse 27 with me, if you would. Actually, jump to verse 26, and then I'll read 27. The Bible says this. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched Bathsheba to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. Look what it says there at the end, though. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, displeased the Lord. You know, a lot of times we see that in Scripture, that it displeased the Lord and it displeased God. And I think there's something within our human nature that our natural man that can almost, that we couldn't care less about the fact that a, a just, just in man's nature, just, just bear with me what I'm about to say. We couldn't care less that a, a divinity was offended by us. We would always try to make amends for it. What I mean by that is that throughout history, man has turned their heart away from God and has served other gods. But even in those other gods, they've tried to make amends because they failed those other gods. I think within our natural man, that displeasing the Lord, we feel like that's something that we constantly do. And I'll say this. For the most part, as believers, you have to be honest with you, even in uh, sermon prep, that this message a lot of times, and it's probably especially in this day and age, we have a hard time kind of, uh, because we, we are pretty negative with ourselves, that we feel like we're unworthy, and we feel like we displease God a lot. And I think if you're, if you're a Christian worth their salt, there's a part of you that kind of walks around throughout the day at any one point of the day and say, man, I've displeased the Lord, or I'm probably not pleasing the Lord, or you come through... Uh, 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 some type of sinful situation and you step out of that and you go, man, Lord, how can you forgive me? How can you, how can you do that? How can you ever forgive me for this? And how could I do this to you again? Or, or it's something that's the first time you've done it. And you say, man, I, I can't believe I've done that. And, and so you, you struggle with that within your own spirit and that we feel like we displease the Lord. So I'm here to tell you that I don't think it's unnatural for us to have those feelings in the first place or the truth of that happened, that we have displeased the Lord in our life, or we are currently displeasing the Lord. But I'm telling you that God doesn't want us to displease Him, nor, um, nor is that the way that we are in our spiritual life transformed, that our life can please God. We, we can't please God. We're not having to walk around displeasing the Lord and going about our business that way. So I think for us, displeasing the Lord is something we, we read in the Bible and we kind of get accustomed to the fact that, yeah, um, like I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all sinned, and we kind of write it off like no big deal. But man, when you sin against someone, have you, have you ever hurt someone so bad? You, you've sinned against them, you've hurt them so bad that in your own heart, you just feel like a wretched person. You feel like you deserve some of the worst things possible done to you because you did that to somebody, but in the moment you did it, you weren't thinking about that. You were just thinking about fulfilling the lust of your flesh. Or you were thinking about fulfilling what felt right. If you could just burst out uh, whatever you wanted to say and just get, get on with it and say, hey, that's fine. I've, but then afterwards you go, man, I, I feel bad. I wouldn't want to 
I, 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 I need everything done against me. I, I shouldn't do that. The thing is, though, a lot of times we, we, it's not unusual for us to, to have that in our hearts where we, we feel like we displease. Okay. So what, what can we do? What happens when we displease the Lord? I think, any, again, any Christian that's worth their salt would recognize that we feel like we displease the Lord, but we don't want to be stuck in that rut. That we feel like that's all, and we're constantly. I want to remind you that we serve a gracious and merciful God. Okay? Now, that's not to say, now, this righteous God and merciful God, He judges in mercy. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, listen, judgment and mercy met at that point. Judgment and mercy met at the cross, and it's through the person and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord for that. I feel like I'm not saying that impactful enough here tonight. And it ought to be said with some more excitement. Because the fact is that my 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 displeasing displeasement of the Lord and, and my judgment of my sin was met at the cross through the mercy and grace of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that's where it was met. And I praise the Lord for that. So we do serve a gracious and merciful God. But I do want to remind you that sin still has consequences. We still, sin is still present. Just because we may think, well, if I just have a positive attitude and, and I, just, I just speak it out loud and just not, look at, sin's presence is still about us. And we still have to recognize that, boy, we are sinners saved by the grace of God in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Thank the Lord for salvation. But just a reminder that we need we need the grace of God spoken into our lives every day. His mercies are new every day. His compassions, they fail not. We need that. We are able to walk in the Spirit of the Lord. So with that being said, a lot of times when we're, if we're not, um, I thank the Lord that, that He's merciful and gracious. But a lot of times I think we kind of write off this aspect of displeasing the Lord. So I, I want to ask you this question before we jump into this. Are you displeasing the Lord with your life right now? Is the Lord pleased with you? Would you, could you honestly say before God? Now, I'm not talking about just being self-deprecating. I, I want you to ask that question to yourself in a very honest way and say, is the Lord pleased with my life? Is the Lord pleased with the way the trajectory of my life is going? Uh, hold on. Let's do some self-evaluating here tonight. Be a little bit aware, not, not deceiving. You, you got to be honest before God. Tonight, is your life headed to a place that's pleasing God? Some of you say, well, I, I hope so. I, I feel like it is. You know, I feel like I, I'm headed that way. Well, good. Praise the Lord. But it's always something that we have to check down to make sure that we are still, we do not do anything to displease God because our desire is we serve a merciful, listen, we serve a merciful and gracious God that we don't desire to displease him, but we desire to please him. Hold on. Wasn't God good to David? Even David declared in the Psalms that God was good to Israel. How good was God to Israel? God's hand was upon him. Even David said, when they gathered the offering for the temple, he said, oh, what, who am I, God? What is this man and what is thy people that you would be so good to us? David declared that. David knew the goodness of God. And so I think in many ways, our life is that, man, we want to please God. Our desire is not to displease him. And we want to please Him. So, are you pleasing the Lord with your life? Are you following in His ways? Are you, are you as we said the other day, are you not just reading the Bible, but are you, are you studying it? Are you obeying it? Are you applying the Word of God to your life? I mean, these are all important things. That, that are, you, are you faithful to attend the services? Are you faithful to attend your prayer time? Your, your time with the Lord, your devotional time. Are you faithful to do that? Or is it just kind of something that you, you set aside? Well, why is it then that we, we have all these struggles, but yet we don't set aside time to spend with the Lord? We don't know why we're going through I just don't know why this keeps happening. Well, have you done a check down in your life of, man, am I pleasing the Lord with my life, or is my life reflective of displeasure? Am I, am I pleasing myself? Well, many times if we're okay with that and we're taking care of this flesh, a lot of times we're, we're probably more or less not 
not pleasing the Lord. David in this situation saw something with his eyes and decided to fulfill the lust of his flesh and be carnal minded. And certainly, look at, hold on, I mean, we're adults here, let's, let's just be real about it. If there's a gal out on a rooftop bathing, and she's beautiful to look upon as a woman, I mean, guys, guys deal with these things. We have to turn aside from that. David being a king, he got to a point where he was, he was complacent in his relationship with the Lord. He wasn't content with what was going on. Because he needed more. He wanted, he didn't need more. He wanted more. And what he wanted was, was forbidden from him. It was forbidden because it didn't please the Lord in that which he wanted. So we have to start out at the beginning of this as whatever we see our, uh, whatever we set our eyes to. See, the problem was that he looked upon Bathsheba and, and he saw her and then he called for her. See, what ends up happening is this digression. It's actually a progression, but it's a digression in our life that we see it and then we go towards it and we start to draw it into us and it becomes a part of our life. In this situation, David saw a beautiful woman. He needed to turn aside and walk away from that. You say, well, what have you done that, Pastor? What have you gone? Listen, by God's grace, you know, we all have these challenges that face us daily that we have to answer for. It's more, listen, it's more than just seeing Bathsheba on a rooftop. You're faced with whether or not you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Whether you're going to, uh, God has revealed to us through his word that, that we uh, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Have you done that today? Because those opportunities were afforded to you today. Did you do that? That's the question you ought to be asking me. Pastor, did you do that today? And we need to evaluate because we see it like David saw. And what he ended up doing was he acted upon it. His eyes affected his heart. In this case, it was for carnality and not for pleasing the Lord. He wasn't looking to feed his spirit. He was feeding his flesh. And so then, well, we've said this before, unconfessed sin, it, it doesn't just go away. Unconfessed sin begets more sin. That's, that's what it births. It births more sin. And more sin, well, we know this, that the end of all sin is what? It's death. The book of James clearly tells us that when, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So let me just say, if you're displeasing the Lord with sin in your life right now, I'm just here to tell you as a preacher, because I love you, and as your pastor, that the end of this is death. It's not a, it's not a good ending. In some way, it's, it, you say, well, what do you mean? Am I going to die from this? Look, it, that, that would be an extreme uh, possibility, but it, it's definitely a possibility. To say that God hasn't taken people away because of sin in their life, Hey, listen, I mean, I'd be amiss to say tonight that God hasn't done that and hasn't proved out in Scripture and even throughout life that God hasn't done that. There's no doubt. But sometimes we look at it as that such finality, that final thing of death, but sometimes the finality is the death of a relationship. We, we've seen that happen. We've seen it where, where, where folks go through uh, friendships or even relationships and they're severed and they're broken from it. They say, well, I can afford that. Can you? That's a lot of mental stress. We wonder why we deal with so many mental aspects in our society today. It's because we're not dealing with relationships properly according to the Lord. In fact, if I could say this, our desire is that we're pleasing self. See, when we decide to quit pleasing the Lord, then we're just pleasing self. We're not interested. If we can't please the Lord, we're not interested in pleasing people around us. We're more interested in pleasing ourselves. Even when we say, I'm a people pleaser. We say that. I say that because I'm also, um, I, I would say that by definition, I would be like a people pleaser. I try to be a people pleaser. It's something I have to work against in a lot of ways because I want, as a, I want to be a preacher of righteousness and tell you the truth in love, with charity. Amen? But we say people pleasing, and really what people pleasing is, is just arrogancy and pride that says, I want people to like me. I want to get along so that people will like me, and I can build up my little uh, kingdom, or my big head, if you will, so much that I can't fit through a door, uh, because I'm prideful about it, and I just want people to like me. Hey, listen, God help us to repent of that spirit, 
and, and just please God. And when we please God, these relationships will start to get, to get right. Okay, you with me here tonight? Is this all making sense? So what we need to do is we need to identify that we're displeasing. That we're displeasing. Or maybe tonight we, we, you're having a hard time whether or not you're, you're displeasing the Lord. So let's run a diagnostic tonight. Okay, I know you've been in the sermon here for a moment, but let's, let's plug in here, all right, for this. Let's run a diagnostic. Are we pleasing the Lord? And we want to see that from this passage right here tonight, okay? Now, bear with me. We're all, we'll, we'll run this diagnostic. And you check for yourself. Do a spiritual checkup here, okay? I want you to know that whenever, number one, whenever we're displeasing the Lord, it's always obvious to God. It's always obvious to Him. He always knows what's going on. He's not oblivious to it. You say, well, that's kind of a, uh, that's kind of a weird statement, Pastor. Uh, like, it's, it's always obvious to God. Of course it's obvious to God. No, that's not a declaration of God. That's more of a declaration to us to remind us that, that no sin goes unchecked. That God knows the inner parts of our heart. He knows, listen, sometimes we say that, well, God knows my heart. Well, have you ever considered what the heart is? I, I love it when people say that to me because I'm sitting there going, do you really want God to know your full heart? Because if he knows your heart, which he does, and you want to expose that before God, you say, well, God knows my heart. Well, he knows a lot about your heart. And it's desperately wicked. That's what it comes. Who can know it? The Bible tells us. So it's more of a declaration to, to us to remind us in this diagnostic that, that sin doesn't go unchecked. It's obvious to God that we're displeasing him. The Bible says in verse 27 of chapter 11, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And by the way, that word displeased there is not just, I should have said this away at the beginning, but that word displeased it right there that it, that it talked about is with like utter disgust. It's of, it's of righteous anger that God has. In fact, that word has been used several other times in Scripture, and most of the time it followed a, a destruction. So much so that even what displeased the Lord, uh, uh, when Moses struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to it, it displeased the Lord so much that Moses was hindered from going uh, into the promised land. It hindered him. It displeased the Lord. That, that's something that, uh, again, I think we need to get a hold of in our life that God's displeased with sin. When's the last time that you just really checked out? Well, I know I sinned. And you kind of write it off because you're, you're, you're trying to make yourself feel good or you're trying to callous over the fact that something's wrong. And you say, well, I know I sin. I know I sin. If you could say it that flippantly, then I don't think you have a good grasp of what sin is. Hold on. Jesus died for sin. A, a perfect God had to come down in the flesh and die for your sin and mine, and we kind of write it off as, well, it's just sin. I, I know I sin. You see what I'm saying? I, that's where we get messed up a little bit in our thinking, a lot of it in our thinking, is that it's not oblivious to God. God is not, it's not occurring to him, oh, they're sinning. Oh, I can't believe they're sinning. It displeases him. The Bible says that even that word can be used in the New Testament, when the Bible says that we grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, that's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That when Paul's writing that, he's letting them know that they ought not to displease or grieve the Holy Spirit. He flees. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We don't want to grieve the heart of God. Do you? If it's not a big deal to you tonight that it's, a, that it's obvious to God, or it's not a big deal to you tonight that you've grieved God. Well, diagnostic so far then has proven that you failed this part. The test has proven that you failed and you need to get it right with God. If it's grieving your heart that you grieve the Lord, then it's showing you that, hey, maybe there's an area that you're displeasing God, get it right. And past that area. Number two tonight, I want you to know that it's not, it's, it's, let me say that again. Number two is that it's obvious to others. But deceit is a, it's a horrible mind game. 
And so what would he mean? So, to kind of piggyback off that phrase, sometimes whenever we say, hey, is this going on in your life? Or we are approaching something, you know, and, and sin in someone's life, or, or we're concerned about it. Hey, how are you doing? Are you doing right? Or you may ask me that. And if we say something like, yeah, I'm fine. I mean, you don't know my heart. You don't know what, you know, you don't know what my heart's about. Well, sure. It's because we can't pinpoint that. Only God knows a lot of times. We can't pinpoint stuff. But you know, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is in agreement. When a believer is in agreement with another believer, that Spirit is in agreement with one another. Do you understand? That's why, that's why when the church prays, that's why, that's why Jesus said when two on earth are in agreement about the things in heaven, you can ask anything in, in my name and I will do it. He wants that spirit to be in agreement. That's why, hold on, oh, this is so good. That's why Peter wrote that our prayers are hindered if our relationship between a husband and wife is off. Our prayers are hindered. Hold on, you're wanting, wanting God to answer prayer for you, but maybe your relationship is off. Your prayers are hindered at this point. Your spirit is not in agreement with one another. But that's with all relationships. That's with, that's with even your relationship within your church family. There's been times I've come to church and, and there's times where I've, had to, I've asked someone, hey, how are you doing? And they've gotten all upset and been out of shape just for me asking how they're doing. Is that you're making that up? I'm not making it up. But I'm sitting there going, man, their spirit doesn't seem right. And come to find out something was going on within their spirit. Hold on, it's not... It's not People aren't oblivious to it as well. On the test number two, you say, well, where do you get that from? Oh, Joab. If you go to verse 21, Joab, um, and actually in verse 20, that Joab sent uh, and told, going back up to verse 18, I guess, he sent a messenger back to David to tell David what happened, uh, that Uriah is dead, but he also sends in a little note there. Let me, let me read it just to be clear. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger saying, when thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so, be that the king's wrath arise. And he say unto thee, wherefore approached ye so nigh into the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not that uh, they would shoot from the wall? Meaning if David gets upset at the fact that we got close to the wall and that Uriah would die because the messenger didn't know what was going on. Okay, he, Joab's letting him know that um, in this message to the, through the messenger, this is code. I want you to let David know. But what I'm going to tell you, uh, everything, he's just telling him, the messenger may didn't fully understand it, but I'm telling you, David knew what Joab was saying to him. Okay, does that make sense? When he says, if David, if the king gets, uh, if he gets mad because Uriah died and we're so close to the wall. But Joab knew that it was King David that gave the orders for Uriah to die. But the messenger doesn't know that, okay? You see what I'm saying? Verse 21, this is what he says then. Joab says, tell him this. Joab tells him a little story to remind David about in Judges when Abimelech, the son of uh, Jerubbasheth, he said, did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So he's basically telling him, hey, look, just like back in Judges, if you will, when Abimelech got close to the wall, remember we got to the wall of the city, if you remember, so I don't have time to go back to the story. But a woman was trying to crush his skull and she took a millstone from a high point and threw it off and this huge heavy millstone cracked his head and he was dying and he looked at his armor bearer and said take a sword and drive it through me so it's not said that a woman took me out <laughs> kind of interesting that Joab, Joab uses that with David and he's using this as a story something to be interested in here because Joab's not oblivious to the fact that David is sinning here because what he's saying is a woman has slain another man here but you've decided to take the sword of the armor bearer and pierce him he's letting him know that David I know that you're sinning here I look beyond this but also to let you know that Uriah is dead what you wanted is done but I don't like it you know a lot of times you sit there and go wow we decipher those things 
you think that what you're doing, you're getting away with it, but it's, it's not oblivious to others. A good diagnostic, if, if we're displeasing the Lord, is that others around us are starting to notice that something's wrong. Hey, you doing okay? Why does everyone keep asking me that? Maybe you ought to introspect and say, man, something's going on. I know many times when I'm kind of grouchy and grumpy, my wife will say, you take a nap. You take a nap. You all right? She's recognizing something's off with me. It's not right. I'll tell her sometimes, man, I just need to go pray. Uh, my spirit's not right. I need to go pray. By the way, I think I say that often, actually. <laughs> There's a lot of times I need to do that. So run into this diagnostic. Are others around you noticing? All right, quickly here tonight. God knows how to reveal these things. I'm not going to take the time, but in chapter 12 and verses 1 through 8, God sends the preacher. He uses the word of the Lord, the word of God. Now, it's not just the preacher, but the, your Bible reading, your time with God. God reveals those things to you. He knows how to reveal it. Isn't it, isn't it loving that God knows how to reveal those things to us in such a way? Is God revealing growth in your life? Is he revealing through the word of God, through preaching, and through the reading of the word of God in your life? The diagnostic here is, are you allowing the word of God to grow you and to, and to work in you? Okay? If God is working, don't be afraid when God convicts you. Take it in. Accept it. Say, man, praise the Lord. God is speaking to me. Let God take the, the, the light of the word of God Take it to a dark place in your heart and expose it so that so that you can get right before the Lord. So that's what he does. I'm telling you, when I'm reading my Bible, I want to read it uh, for instruction, for transformation. I want to read it for renewing of the mind so I get the junk out of my mind and I get the right stuff in my mind. I want to feed the Spirit. A lot of times we're more interested in feeding the flesh uh, than we are feeding the Spirit. And we're wondering why we keep battling so hard. David sent the prophet Nathan and gave him this whole story. Excuse me. God sent Nathan, the prophet, to David to expose and reveal David's sin. David knew what was going on. He thought he'd gotten away with it, but God wanted him to know, you haven't gotten away with it. And by the way, you're not going to get away with any sin in your life, unconfessed sin. God's going to deal with it. So he sends the, the prophet there, and Nathan comes up, gives him this story. And, and David gets all upset in this story at the person who's egregious. He said, what's the story about? Go back and read it yourself. And what ends up happening? David goes, David goes, oh. He gets all mad and, says, Go, and tells, hey, whoever this guy is, make him pay. And Nathan looks at him and goes, thou art the man, David. God knows what you did. In fact, so much so, look at this. Verse 12 of chapter 12. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Hey, I don't know about you. I'm thankful that I can confess my sin and God is faithful and just to forgive me for all my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I'm very thankful that God didn't take all my sin and put it on a Blu-ray and let you see it or put it on Netflix. Amen? You know what I'm saying? God didn't take all my sin and expose it before everybody. But I'm telling you, to get us, to get David right, there, there's something to that, that God was revealing the sin. Hey, listen, is the, is the Word of God revealing sin in your life? Are you allowing that to? Okay? Am I displeasing the Lord? Well, is the Word of God revealing my displeasure with God? If not, then you say, well, then I'm pleasing the Lord. No, are you allowing the conviction to take place, or are you just callousing over it? Verse 12 is a reminder to us that there's still consequences with sin, okay? But again, I want to remind you that truth and mercy and justice met at the cross at the shed blood of Christ. And it was glorious, res gloriously resurrected on the third day. Amen? The last thing here tonight is if you've gone through this diagnostic and you feel like you failed in this part, I mean, certainly all of us at some point or another, we're looking at this going, man, then can I just encourage you, the biggest thing that David could do was confess it, forsake it, and get right. Verse 13 in chapter 12, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. God's mercy to David was that he wasn't going to die. 
he confessed his sin, he got it right. And there were still consequences. The baby born to David and Bathsheba would die. The sword would never leave David's house. I mean, it was it was a tough, it was, it, it was a bloody house in David's house because of his sin. It's a reminder, sin has consequences and no man sins unto himself. But I want to remind you, it's a whole lot better than full wrath of God. God's mercy is evident here in David's life, so much so. David would write Psalm 51 in response to all this. And he would just send and spend his time confessing to God. You know what he needed was to restore unto him the joy of his salvation. Maybe tonight you just need to ask the Lord to help restore the joy of your salvation tonight. Confess your sin. Are you joyful in the Lord? Are you happy in the Lord? Maybe it's because the fact is that the joy has gone out from your life. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But have you gotten away from that? Have you gotten away from your salvation being a joyful thing? Are you more interested in pleasing yourself and displeasing God? It's a good diagnostic for us here tonight. Something worth looking into. If so, let's confess it and make it right. Well, then this is going to cure me. Now you got to get up tomorrow morning and fight some more battles. Amen? But get it right. Get it right before God. Say, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? You know, maybe tonight you need to call up someone you know and say, I was wrong. Maybe you need to tell a child, the parents, you need to tell your children, I was wrong. I lied to you. Will you forgive me? Maybe your children, you need to say that to your parents tonight. Husbands, wives, whatever the case, maybe you need to say that tonight to each other. I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Confess it. Well, I just, I just don't want it to go bad. It's going to get a whole lot worse if we're not taking, it, if we're not pleasing the Lord the, the right way. So let's please God. Let's be more interested in that. Father, I pray that you just uh, bless this time tonight. Help us to have a, a good time to understand that we want to please you and not displease you. Thank you for this time in the Word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today in services here or with this video at North Hills Baptist Church. If you made a decision or need prayer in a specific area, please contact us through our social media platforms, our website, or the number on the screen. We know the world offers no true satisfaction, and it's definitely full of uncertainty in this time. We just want to encourage you uh, in hope and in faith in Jesus Christ here at North Hills Baptist Church. If someone you know that needs prayer or has questions, would you please do us a favor and have them contact us, or another way, is you can personally share this video with them through your social media platform, platform, excuse me, and you can also subscribe to our YouTube page. That would be a big help to us. Uh, or uh, if you would, uh, get this timely and godly message out to them. We have several other messages on our YouTube page that is for geared towards children and teenagers. So if you'd like to look at those on our YouTube page, please do so. Again, subscribe and then like our Facebook page and be sure to share this with others. We also want to encourage you that if you'd like to give, or members that would like to give to uh, electronically, we use a platform called Tithely, and we'll have that up there as well. It's also on our website. You can download the app, or you can give online uh, by looking up North Hills Baptist Church in San Marcos, California. Thank you for joining with us here today, and if we can be a blessing to you, please let us know. Take care.